Hello and welcome to our final in our conversation in conservation in 2021. Thank you all for being with us today. I'm Sherry Henning, Chief Advancement Officer of the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. We're really glad that you're here. Um, we're going to be talking to you today about the critically endangered guar gorillas and all the work that we're doing in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. We've got an incredibly um, full, full talk for you today, talking about all of the work in the Congo, um, what we're doing there um, with all the biodiversity. We often refer to it as the space that is the lungs of our planet. Um, so I'm really excited for you to hear all of the work that's happening. And today you're going to hear from the um, two great men that are in the thick of it um, day to day, um, Dr. Ins Insay Vanderhoek. Um, he is our uh, biodiversity researcher there and uh, Urban Ngobobo, um, director of Congo programs um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And of course, our very own um, president and CEO, and Chief Scientific Officer, Dr. Tara Stowinski. Um, so as you can imagine, um, housekeeping is even more important today, knowing that Urban is coming to us from the Congo, um, as well as Inse is joining us from Rwanda. So we hope um, that we do not have any connection problems, but just in case, um, Tara will take great care of us um, here and take over as needed. Um, but we really hope that you enjoy today's talk. Um, and if you missed any of our other previous conversations, they are on the website and you can go and enjoy those anytime um, that you need to. And this will be uh, recorded and up and available uh, later on in the week for you as well. So again, thank you for all that you do for us. Um, you are so important to the Fosse Fund um, through your support and donations uh, throughout the year. Um, so with that, I will welcome in uh, Dr. Tara Stowinski to take it away. Thanks. Thanks, Sherry. And hi, everyone from Atlanta. It's lovely to be with you again. Uh, I am ex very excited, as Sherry said, for the program we have today, where we'll get to tell you a bit about the incredible work that's happening in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I am going to share my screen. So uh, late last month, we actually celebrated the annual uh, gorilla baby naming ceremony in Rwanda, which is organized by the Rwandan government. And so these are just some of the adorable babies that receive their names. So every year, all the babies born uh, over the course of the year receive their names and each of their names has a very special meaning. I'm not gonna have time to go through them all right now, but I would encourage you to go to our website on our news page. We actually have a story with each of the babies that receive their name and also what that name means. We also last month celebrated World Gorilla Day. Uh, this is the day that we helped launch in 2017. So it was the fifth anniversary of World Gorilla Day. And we took the time to kind of reflect back on what have we as an organization achieved since then? And I wanted to share this quick video with you. video says we really owe um, our achievements over the last five years to, to you, our supporters. And we didn't even get to mention in there that our community programs have served tens of thousands of people. And also that um, we've trained over a thousand young Rwandan and Congolese biologists. So we're incredibly proud of that work and thank you for helping that to happen. 
So without further ado, I want to welcome you to our program in Congo. Karibu is the Swahili word for welcome. This is actually the gate to our Incuba Conservation Area base. And just as a little bit of history, uh, in 2001, the organization made the strategic decision that we wanted to expand beyond mountain gorillas. And so we looked at the conservation landscape to figure out where was our expertise most needed, which gorillas were most in danger. And we decided to move into the Congo to protect another subspecies of gorillas, the Growers gorillas. These animals were suffering incredible declines as a result of civil unrest, um, poverty, and other challenges that we'll hear about today. And so we've been working in that area now for 20 years. The first 10 years, we were really helping to build capacity. And in 2011, we changed our strategic approach to really focus on what we do best, which is boots on the ground, science, and building communities. And that's what you're going to hear about today is our decade-long work in the Incuba Conservation Area to work alongside local communities to help protect growers gorillas, particularly those that do not have any formal protection in national parks. So with that, I'd like to introduce our incredible panel. I'm going to start off with Dr. Inse Vanderhoek, as, as Sherry mentioned. He is a biodiversity research with us in at the Fossey Fund. He works with our programs both in Rwanda and Congo. And Inse, I'm going to let you tell the group a little bit about your background and what brought you to the Fossey Fund. Thank you, Terra. Thank you, uh, everyone, for having me. Uh, good afternoon. So I'm originally from the Netherlands, but I was very quickly drawn to the tropics as my, my place of study. I'm an ecologist. So the first thing I wanted to do for my master's and my undergraduate thesis work is to go to Africa. Uh, I worked in Gabon a little bit on buffalo. You see me scooping up some buffalo poo over there, uh, looking at their diet. And soon after, I went to Kenya to look at community conservation with the Maasai in Kenya. And that kind of got me into the travel virus. And as the moment I could, I kind of hopped over to the other side of the Atlantic and got to roam the South American continent a little bit as a tour guide. And after a little stint as a tour guide in South America, I managed to settle in New York, uh, do my PhD at the City University of New York. Uh, I finally got to work on one of my favorite groups of animals, birds. Um, but really what I wanted to do is not just look at birds, but look at how species interact and how species interact with their environment. So I did my PhD in New York. I had a brief career stop in the Caribbean before moving back to the Amazon, to Ecuador this time, where I helped establish uh, a brand new university called Ikiam University. I finally got to, to do a lot of research in the field, in the forest. Uh, also did some education uh, in terms of establishing new uh, undergraduate programs in the Amazon for Ecuadorians, um, really good stuff. But I was missing one particular thing that's a direct link with conservation. So I was working in academia, but I got the opportunity about three, almost four years ago now to move over back to Africa to work as a biodiversity researcher for the Dan Fossey Gorilla Fund. Uh, I finally got to do everything I wanted, ecology, work on a lot of different species, and have a direct contribution to conservation. Wonderful. Thank you, Inse. Uh, Urban, I'd like to introduce Urban Ngobobo, who is the director of our Congo programs. Urban, this is his 10th year of working with the Fossey Fund. And so, Urban, welcome from Kinshasa, and would love for you to tell the group a little bit about your background. Yeah, good afternoon from Congo, everyone. I'm Irbengo Bobo, the country director of Fossi Found here in Congo. I'm Congo is born in a town near Kauzibiega National Park, actually. Kauzibiega National Park is the only place where you can, you can visit the Grauri's gorillas. During my childhood, uh, I, I, I learned a lot about, about the Grauri's gorillas. When I visited them in the Kauzi Biega, I was, it was really amazing to see how a giant apes could be, giant, it could be gentle as it was, as I found them. But also I was a bit upset to see how the community living around uh, that part were living in a severe poverty. And severe poverty and already nourished uh, antipathy toward the wildlife conservation at the point that they conspired with the poachers to slaughter the gorilla. Then it was a shock for me. I decided to, to study a science which could give me some skills to, 
some key skills to, to contribute to the, uh, the wildlife conservation at the same at the same time to contribute to the community well-being. Now I've got a, I've got a bachelor degree in rural development and a master's degree in innovation development and development and society. I've worked I've worked in Congo with several organizations, including Zoological Society of London, Frankfurt Zoological Society, in many many parts in Congo, and I had some some responsibility, some work in other parts in in Africa, such as Ngorongoro Crater and the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. I've been working with a fossil found since 11, uh, 2011. I've, it was really a bit difficult decision to take to leave my former organization to fossil found, but I was really very tempted by the vision of fossil found to expand the conservation of gauris gorillas outside protected area. Uh, so I joined, I joined, I joined the, I joined uh, Dan Fossi. As you can imagine, you can imagine in my life, my working life, I face, I had really many, many good experiences. Actually, I'm the president of African Primatological Consortium for Conservation. I travel for many, many training outside the country, but beside that also, I face really some dangerous situation such as being kidnapped by rebel in Virunga, in Kauzi Viega. But what is good for that, we didn't give up. We still focused on gorilla and on the community well-being. Actually, I'm completing with support from my organization, support from the scientific committee of my organization. I'm completing my, my, my PhD in natural resources management and development at Antananarivo University. Thank you, Thanks, Urban. Sorry. Thank you, Urban. We are, we are so lucky to have all the talent that you bring to the organization from your many experiences. And really the program that you guys are going to hear about today, the Incuba Conservation Area, was born out of Urban's vision. So Inse, why, um, can you tell us a little bit about the area where we're working in Eastern Congo, kind of about these forests, about what's special about them? Absolutely. So those of you who have attended previous webinars might have seen a map of Nkuba or Eastern Congo, but I want to kind of show that from a different perspective. So here what we see mapped is biomass and you can see this green forest. It's really what Sherry said in the introduction of, of this webinar. They're the lungs of the world together with the Amazon. And if we look at the eastern part of Congo, we see Nkuba conservation area really at the border of lowland primary rainforest and upland habitat, so high elevation forest. And it's at that transition zone where we have a lot of biodiversity and it's exactly there where we have the Nkuba conservation area right in between two established national parks, Maiko National Park and Kahuzi Diega National Park. Fabulous. And maybe talk to us a little bit about kind of why we would create or have an Nkuba conservation area, something outside of national parks. Yeah, so th those two national parks that I just mentioned, you can see them in, in light green here, they cover only a very small portion of the Growers Gorillas home range, these kind of diagonally striped, uh, diagonally striped area there. And, and that's one of the problems. And even within these national parks, there are a lot of threats that the Growers Gorillas are facing. So Growers Gorillas are declining very rapidly, and that's one of the reasons why we moved into this particular area. Yeah, so to help provide, you know, that corridor, hopefully, between these two national parks, because if we look over here at the mountain gorilla habitat, you can see how little habitat is left, and then it's fragmented. So you've got the Virunga mountain gorilla population here, and then the windy population here, and they cannot intermix. And it's one of the things that we're hoping to prevent in Congo is that these two national parks become isolated from each other, because right now there's beautiful forest in between. And so Inse, could you tell us a little bit about what the threats are to Grower's gorillas and to their habitats um, in, in Congo? Yeah, the, th the threats are many really, and we have a lot of threats that we would see anywhere in the world, so climate change, for example. But if I have to single out two particular threats for this particular area of Congo and the Grower's gorilla in specific, uh, it would be, first of all, poaching, so bushmeat hunting, uh, depletion of local fauna, that has directly led to a decline in grouse gorillas numbers, but also the collapse of ecosystems in general. And the other one would be deforestation. So deforestation through different means has a big impact in this area. 
uh, logging would be one of these deforestation drivers in a lot of places in the world. It's not very commercialized here. Here, what we really have is two things, is expansion for agriculture and mining. So when we look at these photos, we see on the top right, we see an area that has long been converted to agriculture. That's near the city of Goma. And on the left, we see an almost pristine rainforest near or in Cuba conservation area. And what's very worrying is that once we go from Goma to and Cuba conservation area, we say landscapes as the one in the bottom right, where we have very rapid and recent conversion of forests to agricultural land. So that's one of the main drivers of deforestation. The other one is mining. So mining is a big problem for a lot of reasons. Um, so we have local artisanal mining, which has a small scale, but is very numerous, uh, has a lot of local damage, pollution with heavy metals, chemicals, etc. Trees have to be cut for the mining activities. But we also have these large gazette that we can see here in pink mining concessions that surround in Cuba, where we have commercialized mining. Mining itself is damaging, but it's really the problem there is that it also attracts infrastructure. Infrastructure We have roads going to the mining sites. They open up the forest more. We have people that move into these areas that need food. And that, again, uh, has consequences for that bushmeat hunting, the poaching that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, thanks, Inse. It's very sobering to see, particularly, you know, again, all of this area around in Cuba that um, has been has been designated. It doesn't mean there's active mining going on there, but there is the opportunity for exploration. So let's step back a little bit and talk about how amazing these forests are. Obviously, they're home to growers, gorillas, but they're home to a lot of other species as well. And Inse, yeah, maybe, so, yeah, sorry, you can talk a little bit about yeah. that. Yeah, so, so luckily, Despite these threats, there's still a lot of biodiversity. There's a lot of unique species that are what we call endemic. They're only found here in this particular area of Congo. Uh, we have, of course, also our, our, our threatened great apes, the grouse gorillas, the chimpanzees that you see in two of these photos here. We have a lot of larger mammals, elephants, buffalo, a lot of antelopes. We see a bongo here in this smaller photo in the middle. Uh, we got bush babies in, in the bottom there. Um, and then once we go to smaller species, that's where the richness of species really picks up. So when we go to our birds, our hornbills that are very unique to this area, we get a lot of different species. And then when we look at insects, well, that's really where we have uh, the jackpot. Great. Yeah. And I think it's really valuable to mention that grower gorillas are found nowhere else in the world. They are only found in Eastern Congo. So their conservation is really critical on this part of, of the world where we're working. And these um, most of these images that you see here were actually taken by camera traps. So this is one of the ways that we study this biodiversity. It's a huge area where we work. We can't cover all of it every day. So we have camera traps that are set throughout the forest to capture and help us document biodiversity. And INSEA actually just let a paper that's coming out on what we found from our camera trap studies and we created a short little video that I just wanted to share with you. So those are just some of the animals that we've been able to capture on our camera traps. Um, but that's not the only way that we collect data. It's one of the methodologies that we use. And Inse, I wondered if you could walk us a little bit through these slides to talk about some of the other ways that we gather information on the gorillas and the habitat. Yeah, so the gorillas, the grouse gorillas in Incuba are not habituated, which means they're not used to people following them around like we have in Rwanda. Uh, cameras, camera traps, as we call them, solve part of that problem. So we can see them without getting close. The other one is to track gorillas, but keeping about a day distance from them. 
In order to do that, we need to look at footprints. You can see on the left there, we need to look at where they have been eating, where they have been walking, what fruits they've been nibbling on, uh, which you see on the bottom. And eventually, where have they spent their nights? Where have they made their nests? And you see an arboreal nest if you look very closely in the middle of the photo on the right. So what we do is we go with the team and we track the gorillas day by day from nest site to nest site, right down everything they've been eating, how far they've been traveling, et cetera. And that gives us a lot of information about them. Great, yeah. And we had a, a um, journalist that recently embedded with our teams and he shared a video and, and discussed the trackers on CNN. And we, we thought it would be fun for you to hear from his perspective, what it's like to be a Fossey Fund tracker studying gorillas. I was with a group of trackers who've been doing this for 15 years. And when you're there, you know, 10 yards away from a 200 kilo uh, alpha male gorilla, and he's just staring at you and he could snap your neck like a pencil, but he's just hanging out. It's, it's unforgettable. And, and one of the great experiences of my life. I, I, I can't imagine. I mean, you, you touched on uh, the, the, the trackers. Um, given the circumstances, how difficult is their work? I mean, they're, they're in the, uh, the Congo jungle for weeks at a time, right? I, I like to think of myself as, as, as a pretty hardy person, a pretty tough person. And these guys just destroyed me. I mean, they, they spend weeks, sometimes months out there. We spent about five days there carrying 20 kilo packs, going through rivers, it rains all night. So you're constantly going through the mud. You have to set up your camp. You have to get your water from the river and boil it. You need to deal with angry hornets. You have to deal with bugs, bad weather. And these guys, I, I like to, I spent a little time in Nepal and the, in the, the Himalayas and these guys are kind of like high trained, high altitude Sherpas. I mean, they're so used to it. And they, they, they carry twice as much weight as me and are twice as fast they get to camp, they can build tables, they can build beds in nothing flat, and, and they can find these gorillas, and they, they daily follow these gorillas. Part of the gorilla pack is not habituated to humans, so they're a day behind, and so they need to pay attention. They're kind of like detectives. Oh, here's, here's a bed in the grass, here's a bed in the tree, here's half-eaten fruit, here's some of their scat, just so they can keep an eye on the gorillas but stay at a safe distance. Great. I was... Um, so I, I love that story because I think it really goes to the effort that it takes for our teams to protect the gorillas um, and study them as well. But we don't just look at the gorillas, just like our programs in Rwanda, we're really interested in the health of the whole ecosystem. And so Inse, I wondered if you might tell us a little bit about this photo. Yeah, so, so gorillas don't live in a bubble, right? They interact and depend on their environments and for food and habitat. So they need the whole ecosystem. And that means that in order to protect and understand the gorillas, we need to understand other species as well. So one of the things is what we do is look at those camera trap uh, images and the footage to see what other species we have. But we also do direct observational studies. And one great place where we can do this is in these little clearings that you see in this photo that we call salt licks or clay licks. They are very uh, mineral rich soils, a lot of water is there and it attracts a lot of species like the endangered gray parrots. Uh, some of them come for the water, some come for the minerals. And we also have other species than the gray parrot. We have our growers coming as well, our growers gorillas. And we don't really know why they're coming yet. Are they coming for the minerals? Are they coming for the water? A very interesting topic of research right now. So here they are moving through another one of these salt licks that was captured on the camera traps. So in say, just to sort of sum up, we've heard a little bit about being out in the forest, collecting data, protecting the gorillas. What have we um, learned? You know, Grower's gorillas are really considered the least understood of all of the gorilla subspecies. So what have we learned about them through some of this work? Yeah, just, so just tracking them day by day, we know how far they walk. So we know that they actually have pretty long daily travel distances that we call it in pretty large home ranges. Uh, larger than their mountain gorilla cousins in Rwanda, which means they need a lot of space for conservation as well. We also know that they eat a lot of fruits, uh, more like the Western gorilla does as well. So it's really a, a lowland primary rainforest adapted species. We know they make arboreal nests rather than nests on the ground. 
We know a little bit about the social structure. So they usually have one silver, silver back, whereas some of the mountain gorilla groups can have two or, or three or even more silver backs. So, so those are the things that we are learning about the gorillas by following them in the way we do. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I mean, really pretty much everything, except we don't get the detailed behavioral observations that we can get in Rwanda because the gorillas are used to our presence, but pretty much everything else in terms of diet, ranging, um, you know, uh, social structure, we're able to do even just from following them one day behind and, you know, adding important data to help with conservation. Urban, I want to turn to you now because we've sort of talked about our work with being out in the forest and protecting the gorillas, but a big part of our work is also surrounding the local communities. And so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the Incuba community and our work with them. Yes, you know, the community surrounding, living around the Incuba conservation area where we work depends entirely on the forest depend entirely on the forest for, for food, for medicine, even for job. So, so the exploitation of forests didn't been really strictly regulated. To avoid that, to avoid that, to avoid, to avoid the pressure, the human pressure on the forest and the, to reduce the dependence of that community on the forest, we have developed some many, many, many strategies, uh, many, many strategies, including uh, creating employment permanent employment permanent uh, occasional job inside the in, in the in the villages so it means that actually we have got we have created 120 120 permanent job eight 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 occasional job each month in uh, in terms of uh, local uh, local stuff that we hire in the forest in terms of porters it means that in the village now the community are having money so to avoid that, that money being used to buy bush meat because lack of food alternative, we have also supporting the community in activities which aim to create food alternative, such as agriculture, uh, livestock, uh, fish farming. Uh, this is just to, in order to, to promote vegetable food, domestic animals, prod production capable to substitute substitute to the to the bush meat uh, in, in bush meat in the village and also allow food diversity composition in the household and this is another way to address the malnutrition in the villages but because you know to conserve wildlife to contribute to the community well-being you must be first in the in a good health condition that's why also we provide support in health care sectors by building clinics by equipping those clinics by essential equipment and the medicine and the, and the medicine uh, that is a good way to improve the community access to the primary health care but also we face we are in the community where the rate of the the, the education rate is very low to address that also and uh, also to address the earlier marriage, the rape, and uh, ensure that we are preparing the next generation generation of conservationists. We support young pupils and the student with scholarship uh, at range of 408 eight students a year. But our support goes through household, through association, and especially human association. As you know, in African life still, Women play a major role in the daily world, in the daily life of the community. That's great, Urban. And just to reiterate some of, I think, the really critical points you make, you know, providing jobs, over 120 people have permanent employment. And then we usually use about 80 porters a month to help carry those heavy supplies that you heard Thomas reference in the video. Um, and then also these pro projects around food security. Um, most people in Congo, in fact, Congo has the second highest rate of people living in extreme poverty in the world. So more than three quarters of the population. And in this region in particular, there really hasn't been a diversification of food. So people grow one stable crop, cassava, and then they rely on the forest for meat and other things. So trying to help them diversify their crops um, and have domestic sources of meat like fish uh, so that they don't rely on hunting. 
And then finally, you know, what do people get in exchange for, for working with us to protect gorillas on their land? They get jobs, they get these, these food security initiatives, but also really investing in education. And as Ben mentioned, we're supporting the school fees for over 400 students of the local landowners to make sure that they can stay in school. And actually some of the original ones that we started supporting are now graduating. And I think 37 last year passed their national exams. So we're incredibly proud of this investment. And Urban, I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about this particular story, um, as just as one example of this community initiative that, that we do in Congo. Yeah. Maybe we lost. Yeah. Can, can yeah. you hear us? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. I say you see the gentleman on this picture is actually a doctor of the hospital where community neighboring where we work went for their health care. This man have noticed that uh, have noticed that they were really less food diversity in the area and that most of the patients you receive at the hospital suffering from malnutrition. So he make a call, he come to an association where he will bring together a uh, women's we bring together women and uh, try to support them in agriculture, uh, fish farming, livestock, so that they can create food, food diversity in the in the community. They are they are now they are producing a lot right now, and now food for the local community, but also part of the product they sell it to other in other in the market in other villages and the money they gain they have already you know they have already buy a motorbike which will which is helping them to distribute their product in other market in other village and they provide even food for the for those industrial mining around and one thing which is good they are now gaining money even those members of the association has their happy they are, they are gaining money and the money that they are gain for that activities they are now able to, to, to pay for other needs for their household, such as paying for medicine, paying for school fees for adult children, clothing, and so on. Now, uh, the association is called 5V. 5V is one of the associations that we are supporting. We are supporting many, many associations. We provide with them, we provide seeds, we provide agriculture equipment and um, agriculture equipment and now most of them used to be the bush meat seller but they have given up now for the bush meat uh, and now they are involved in the agriculture and the, this activity is really very good because it's have decreased the pressure on the forest because all of do all of these used to be the actors of the poaching Great and say, yeah, to me, this project, I mean, it's just one example of the, a lot of the inspirational projects we work on. I love the fact that it's uh, addressing food security, which as Urban mentioned, many, many people here suffer from malnutrition. So uh, addressing their food security, but then also providing them with livelihoods so they can further invest in improving their lives and engaging women. Gender equity is something that's very important to us at the Fosse Fund. So engaging women who, as Urban mentioned, are often the sellers of bush meat. So now they have another way to bring income into their families instead of um, you know, uh, selling things that have been hunted out of the forest. Thanks, Urban. Um, we're going to turn a little bit, um, you know, our, our, many of you have had the opportunity to visit us in Rwanda. You've seen the gorillas there and know that kind of human communities are living directly adjacent to the gorilla population. The situation is quite different in Congo and uh, Insight put together this quick video that I thought you might enjoy seeing about his commute when he decides to go over, when he's over working with our Congo team from Rwanda. So Insight, I'm gonna play this. Yeah, so, th so this really starts from our from my house in, in Musanzo, Rwanda, where our Rwanda office is as well. Short ride to the border town of Goma. Then it's a 45 minute helicopter flight, more or less, to a town of Walikale, which is in the middle of the rainforest. Uh, as you can see here, after landing in Walikale, it's about two to three hour, if it's good weather, drive to our base camp uh, in the town of Nkuba. And from in Cuba, it can take anywhere between two, three, five days even walking to the forest before you're at your location to actually do research or gorilla tracking. Uh, and that really depends on where you have to be in the forest. 
And, and here we see this example as well, what, uh, what Thomas Nebo said before, this, uh, you know, really hard work walking in the forest, uh, really fast walking, um, <laughs> not as fast as this, but it's definitely fast walking for me. And uh, they end up at a little camp, a semi-permanent camp uh, made of tents and, and, and smaller uh, wooden buildings, uh, very temporary with a very small footprint. Yeah, and I think it's really important because in Rwanda, our trackers go in and out of the forest every day. But because this site is so remote and so big, you know, people are in, our teams are in the forest for up to two weeks at a time. And so that's why they have to carry in all their food, all their supplies, et cetera. So it's incredibly hard work. Um, and so and maybe just walk us through what some of these images are in, say, yeah, so, so these are some of these examples of, of camps that are mostly located at former hunting camps. So we try to kind of convert the hunting camp into research camps in a way as well. And they're really temporary, uh, very small footprint, which means if we leave there, there would be hardly anything left. Um, tented camps where our trackers stay 14 days in, 14 days out, uh, bring all the food with them. Uh, the river is our shower. And that's, that's really where we do most of our forest work. Right, yeah. And then, as uh, Insay mentioned in the video, we also have a base camp. So this is located in the town of Incuba. It's on the edge of the road, so you have to walk quite a distance to get into the forest. But this is where we have more permanent structures. So we have dorms. We're actually building housing for visiting researchers. We have our offices. And the idea is for this to really function as a base camp for our team, but also for researchers from around the world who come, want to come and work and study with us. So you can see here here on the bottom left, we're actually rebuilding our kitchen, building a more permanent structure. One of the challenges we run into is that um, because it's so hot and humid here that we often run into the wood doesn't last very long. So there's no bricks to be found though. And you can imagine you can't really bring bricks in. So it's one of the things we're doing with local communities is working on teaching them brick making so that we can actually build brick structures in the region. So this is a photo that I absolutely love, and I was hoping that uh, Urban can tell us a little bit about the background on this photo and then what this actually, what this day represents. It's, it was a big day in the milestone of the Incuba Conservation Area. Yeah, the people you see on that pictures are landowners. Landowners and the representative of the courts, and the, and, the, and, the, and the policemen, you know, the last Congolese laws allows the local community to apply for the community concession, community forest concession from the government. But obtaining that land certificate is a long, painful, and a costful <laughs> process. Without technical, we, sub, we technically and financially accompany 12 families in the process, and they have obtaining a three concession three community forest concession it took us a lot it, it take it took us almost three years to get there we spend the money we spend time and then i can test i can i can confirm that mayor community just for a mayor community without a technical and financial support it was really it was really unimaginable that the community can have this and uh, Having this document is a look like that the government recognized now that this forest belong to this community. And the one of the fear that alimented those communities by conserving gorilla in their forest, by, by implementing wildlife conservation, it was another way to expropriate them from their forest. But now they realize that they realize that the conservation is not on, is not there to expropriate them, their forest, but beside other factors that they, they, they have seen with us, the conservation is also there to reinforce their, uh, their landowner status. Yeah, it's just wonderful. And, you know, I'm so proud of the fact that we have worked alongside these communities to help bring them official ownership. I mean, in, in the traditional sense, they always own that land, but it was not recognized that way by the Congolese government until this law was passed. And then we helped them go through that certification process, like you said, Urban. So we're incredibly proud of this. And one of my favorite photos from that day was seeing Urban in a suit 
in the middle of the forest as part of this very big ceremony to transfer these land titles over to the local community. And I think Urban, you only kept that on for a few minutes. And then quickly I saw you back in you know, field gear because wearing a suit in the forest is not something that's particularly comfortable. Um, so we wanted to end the seminar with just talking about what is next for our Congo program. We think we're incredibly proud of where we come, but we're even more excited about what's next. And I wanted to show you this map here. So this um, area here in kind of light green represents the current Incuba conservation area. So this is the area that we started working in in 2011. We started with six families at 700 square kilometers. Um, there are now 12 families represented here and it's 1300 square kilometers. And these are the communities that have, you just saw in the photo that have received official recognition. But we really would love to expand this area. And as Urban mentioned, what communities have come to realize is the benefits from conservation. They're seeing their children go to school. They're seeing livelihoods be brought in. And while communities were a bit nervous at first when we would approach them and say, do you wanna work with us on conservation? Now we have them coming to us and asking to be part of our team. So you can see this area in darker green down here. We have already brought this this area onto the Incuba conservation area. So now we're at 1,583 square kilometers. And we're just in the process of finalizing this large area. It's in a different province. So we're having to work with different government officials. Um, but the goal is for this whole area now to be the Incuba conservation area. So we'll have gone from 700 kilometers in 2011 to over 2,300 kilometers in um, you know, 2022. This is roughly half the size of Yellowstone National Park, and I think 15 or 16 times the size of the mountain gorilla habitat in Rwanda. So it's an absolutely huge area. And as you can see here, it is, as we mentioned earlier, strategically located between these two national parks. Um, so our hope is to continue to enable this corridor for wildlife between these two national parks. And we wanted to end the seminar quickly with going back to our friend Thomas and hearing, you know, after he went to visit the Incuba site, what he felt and what he felt inspired by in terms of seeing the work that's happening there. What was your sense after the trip? Do, do you detect more or less confidence for the future of these, you know, incredible creatures? In this particular area, it's called Incuba in, in kind of Eastern Congo, I feel good because what, what Diane Fossey has done is is interact with the locals and win them over. They provide jobs, they provide gardens for the mothers to tend to, uh, they provide better health care for the community, better education for the community. And I think that's the key in a situation like this is to truly be a partner with the local population. It's easy to lecture, it's hard to engage over time, over a year, over five years, 10 years, 20 years. So in the long term with this particular group, I feel confident. Wonderful. And with that, I want to thank everyone for their time. We have some time for questions. So uh, I'm going to come back and we've had a couple come in that I'm going to ask our team. Um, first off, we have a question for Urban. Um, and that is, how do communities feel about the gorillas and feel about wildlife? We might have lost Urban. We'll come back to you, Urban. Hopefully, we can get you connected. Oh, nope, he's back. No, no, I'm okay. Okay, good, yeah. great. Uh, I said, Taga, you know, the strategies that we put in place was was based on what we what we faced before when we start. Nowadays, we are taking the local community from Cuba, where they are, to the Kauzibiga National Park, where they can use it. The, uh, the habituated uh, gorillas, they can also interact with other conservationists there. And they was really, really very surprised to see how the gorilla behave. They, for themselves, they say the gorilla is behaving as they behave in their villages. Before you know, the gorilla that we are protecting in Cuba, they are not habituated. So when the community used to go in the forest to hunt them, it was either the gorilla kill they kill gorilla so it was a kind of conflict relationship but when they visit them they couldn't believe that could happen and the Dutch have changed their mind and now they are saying oh when they come from there many of them they say they give up to eat apes and they used to say you know there are those white men who say that we are cousin to gorilla but we can 
attest that by ourselves, the way they interact with them. And now to protect the gorilla is not something that you are pushing them. It's come from themselves. They like to protect the wildlife. They like to protect the gorilla. And they know that having gorilla in their forest is a value from their forest. That's great, Urban. Yeah, I think it's an important thing to remember that um, the people that live in Incuba don't really get to see gorillas. They're out there, but they don't see them. So taking them down to Cusi Viega, where there are habituated gorillas that you can visit in the same way that you visit mountain gorillas, and letting them really get to see these gentle giants and the gorilla social structure seems to be transformative. Um, it's one of the things we're very proud we're able to do. Um, Inse, a question for you. How, um, you know, can you talk to us a bit about the differences between the Amazon and Congo forest? And also, you know, what is the most exciting thing that you have seen being out in the field? Thank you. Um, the differences are many. And at the same time, it's, it's kind of similar as well. Uh, it's similar in the sense that both of these areas are, are threatened. Uh, they're threatened by different things a little bit, uh, but, but the bigger problems that we have in the, in the world, climate change, uh, land conversion, deforestation, we see on both sides. Uh, so that's the same. Um, the scale at which is happening in Eastern Congo is smaller, fortunately, at this point. Uh, so there's there's a lot of small local intervention in the forest. So that creates a pretty still pristine habitat for the grouse gorillas in, in, in this part of Congo. Whereas in the Amazon, we see an entire tracts of forest that's completely being cleared at the same time. So that's a little bit different. In terms of like walking in the forest, where in the Amazon we have maybe more species, we have a higher richness, so more diversity of butterflies, birds, etc. In Africa, we have the large emblematic uh, mammals. So we have our great apes, we have, uh, well, unfortunately, don't have elephants, in, but we have elephants in the region, Okagi, we have buffalo, <laughs> lots of antelope. So, so that's very different and very exciting uh, to see just footprints of these large animals just on the trails that you're walking in the forest. So that makes it very, very special to be in Africa. Great, and would you say that that, seeing that, the, the, the evidence of the great apes is the is the most special thing or most surprising thing you've seen? Yes, yeah, so, so you mentioned, unfortunately, it's very difficult to see the growers, gorillas directly in Cuba. Fortunately, I got to see them in Cauzi Viega. So that was really, really special. But just seeing the, 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 the footprints or, or where they've been like eating some vegetation or where they had a nest is amazing. Um, but I mentioned in the beginning, I'm also a bit of a bird person. So the, the hornbills and the diversity of birds there, it's also, it's also uh, marvelous. Like it's just amazing to see. Wonderful. Um, we have a question about, can we comment on the population that the expanded in Cuba area might support? And um, I'll jump in and do that quickly. So we actually have just done a huge survey. Um, I can't remember how many transects, but covered that entire area to look for evidence, not just of growers, gorillas, but chimpanzees and other large mammals. Um, and we're in the process of analyzing that data. But our hope is that we probably would have at least 150 gorillas living in that area. And what's really nice is it's continuous with another block of forest. So between Incuba, the expanded area and forest over here, we hope this can provide a tract for a significant number of, for of gorillas. We know that we have roughly 200 um, Grower's gorillas in this in the original in Cuba area and probably about 250 chimpanzees that live there. Um, NC, I don't know if you have anyone that further comment any further on that. No, no, I think I think that, that's about right. And, and in terms of how much more can it support, I, I'm not sure. It, it, I see the question as well. It, it's correct that it will support per square kilometer per acre fewer gorillas than the mountain gorillas uh, in, in Rwanda that can live in a smaller area together. Uh, so yeah, a couple of hundred uh, grouse gorillas we hope to at least be able to, to provide habitat for. Yeah. And we, you know, we put out a story earlier this year that we should probably mention that there was a report that was done that actually increased the estimated number of grouse gorillas. So about in 2017, it was estimated that there were only 3,800 of them left. It's now estimated that there's roughly over 6,000, maybe 6,500 of them left. Um, the important thing, though, to point out is that it isn't because they're increasing in number, but it's just because our data are getting better. So the more data we have, the more that we can better estimate the population size. But you remember that absolutely huge area that we showed. So they're spread out over that enormous area. And as Inse mentioned, because of their ecology, because they're heavily fruit eaters, they need a much larger space than mountain gorillas do. So the 
density that we're seeing of Grower's gorillas in our area is pretty typical of what we see in other lowland forests, um, but very different from mountain gorillas where we really can see a much higher density live in a smaller area, mostly because of their diet, because they don't rely on fruit, they just rely on ground vegetation. Um, we have another question, which is, are there any threats to teams in the forest? Poisonous snakes, dangerous animals. Um, I will throw out there that currently, um, not now, but in previous times, the biggest danger to the teams in the forest was actually other people. So this area of Congo has very high levels of um, rebel groups. And we had a very active rebel group for a while in Incuba and our staff were kidnapped multiple times or Ben can tell more about that or Ben himself has been kidnapped, although not in Incuba, but when he was working in Burunga. And this is unfortunately one of the huge challenges of working in Eastern Congo. What we're very proud of though, is that when these kidnappings have happened, um, and it's probably been about seven years since we've had one, um, the local community has gone and lobbied on behalf of, of the team saying, you know, these are local community members. These are people, you know, the, the Dian Fossey Gorilla Fund are people that we want here. They're working alongside us. They're helping us conserve our forest. They're providing livelihoods for us. And so we've always been able to get our staff back. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything that, to that, um, Urban, but also Inse, maybe you can speak to some of the other wildlife related dangers that the, the team has in the forest. Yes, yeah, sp speaking of animals, um, one of the most dangerous one that you usually have in Africa will be elephants and we don't have them in Cuba. Um, so the second most dangerous one will be the mosquito really. It will be like about diseases being transmitted um, to people. Malaria is fairly common. So that will be the, the biggest threat when it comes to, to animals really. Uh, being in a forest also has other threats in terms of falling logs, falling pieces of things that's actually surprisingly dangerous. Uh, when it comes to snakes uh, and smaller creatures or, or let's say leopards, etc., the risk is fairly small. Uh, there are some snake bites in, in the larger area. Um, there are some venomous species, some cobra species, some mamba species in the area. But as far as the history of our presence there goes, we don't have a lot of problems with our trackers being um, bitten by snakes or etc. So when we walk, we use uh, high rubber boots, for example. Uh, we don't touch the vegetation without looking. So if we do things a bit correctly, and these are all people that come from the area and know very well what to do. So, so those risks, risks are fairly, fairly minimal. Great, thank you. Um, I think we have time maybe for one more question. And this one is for Urban. Um, Urban, um, we were asked, you know, what do you feel is the future of conservation in Congo? How do you feel about it? Are you optimistic? Um, you know, you have been working on the ground in this field. You come from a family that has worked in conservation. And as a Congolese, you know, how do you feel about conservation in your country? Yes, there is hope. And I can say that I'm really very optimistic because we are addressing progressively all those barriers which make us a bit really make us a bit uh, inquisitive. Nowadays, the community have already appropriated themselves the, cons the wildlife conservation, which is a good thing. And the one concern was also their capacity to carry out to implement the conservation activities. But the activity, but the, the strategies that we put on place, we are training local community. We are providing them with equipment. It means that they are now progressively capable to do uh, what we are doing right now without us. And I can tell you right now, our model has been expanded. It's not only in a small Cuba. Right now, we have got community from very far, Kindred Maniema, they are in Cuba right now for the experience changing. They are tracking gorilla in the forest, the exchange with the local community. It means that the model it has been, it's progressively expanded. And that can just give us hope. We hope and we are confident that the future will be positive and the community will continue protecting their forest, their wildlife. That's great, Urban. Yeah, I feel like that's the ultimate measure of success is when the model is exported and it, it is growing without even our involvement. Um, and again, I really wanna thank you for all the work that you have done to help protect wildlife in Congo. 
Um, and with that, I think we will um, we will end this this final series of the year. I want to thank everyone again for participating. I want to thank Inse and Urban for their time and telling their stories. And thank you for all of your support to help make this incredible work happen. We certainly couldn't do it without you. And I, I hope you enjoyed hearing more about the, the work that we're doing in Congo. So have a wonderful day, everyone, and we'll see you again soon.